This is a seven English podcast, and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 91 A Frog in Warm Water. Derek's room was on the second floor of Bale's Mage Tower. As he was an official magician and also managed the sales of low to mid level magic equipment, he received preferable treatment. The first thing that caught Link's attention when he entered the room was the small dining area more than 40 square meters wide. On the side of the dining area was a bookshelf. Link took a closer look and only spotted a few magic books, while the rest were simply items such as novels and anthologies, which were of no importance to a magician. The number of magic books a magician had determined his status. From the looks of it, Derek was not doing very well. These magicians were usually particularly obsessed with money, as it could potentially help them elevate their status. Link knew with a glance that it would be easy to deceive Derek. He probably only needed a few weeks. On the other side of the dining area was another shelf which displayed magic resources and craftwork. Link's attention was grabbed by a wooden circular object about the size of a fist. It had tiny dark green spots all over it. It's a dormant forest spirit root. Link recognized it almost immediately. It looked almost exactly the same as the in-game description of the item and as a previous legendary magician, Link knew all of the in-game items like the back of his hand. The forest spirit was a type of magical creature that possessed both the traits of a plant and an animal. Its roots had extremely high absorption capabilities and one only had to bury the sphere and water it and watch it hatch almost instantaneously. A creature with such strong powers of life naturally contained a lot of magical power, making it a good spellcasting resource. The dormant forest spirit root was considered to be a mid-level spellcasting material and was widely used in many spells. Most of these spells were botanical in nature, however, one of them fell into the realm of dark magic. It was the revival spell and as the name suggested, it was a spell that allowed the user to achieve immortality. However, such spells had overstepped the boundaries of the gods. Any mortal who coveted immortality was considered to have fallen to the dark side, as it was impossible to achieve full success. One might be able to achieve immortality, but definitely at the expense of other important traits. Derek was in charge of procuring magic resources for Bale. This dormant forest spirit root could only be used by level 4 magicians and above. Derek was clearly not strong enough to use it yet, hence it must be for Bale. It looks like Bale has already fallen to the dark side. Link sighed. The reason for Bale's obsession with dark magic was simple. Bale was afraid to die and was already at least 60 years old. The only way to extend his life indefinitely was through dark magic. Derek could never imagine that a simple spellcasting material placed on his shelf would reveal that much information. In his eyes, Link was his money tree. He warmly welcomed Link into his room with an inviting smile. Come, take a seat and have a taste of my flaming wine. Derek did not really respect Link, as he felt Link only managed to enter this mage tower through connections. Deep down, he was even jealous. However, on the account of his gold coins, Derek put on a facade and treated Link extremely well. Link sat down and appeared nervous as he took a sip of the wine before carefully asking, Sir, you called for me? Link's seemingly awkward demeanor bolstered Derek's courage even further. He took out Link's lesser armor magic scroll and asked, Am I right to say that you wrote this? Yes, sir. Link nodded. It is very well written. Derek was speaking from the bottom of his heart. He then continued, However, for such an amazing piece of work, you only receive one silver coin as commission. This is the same as the ordinary, or even low-quality scrolls. It is too unfair. Link deliberately showed a movement in his eyes but kept quiet. Derek definitely had a motive for telling him this much. Looking at Link's expression, Derek chuckled and asked, Do you want to make a fortune from writing scrolls? Sir, what is considered a fortune? Link purposely sounded hasty and eager. Derek laughed. Link's reaction was like a mirror image of his old self. He raised one finger. I will give you one gold coin for every magic scroll, ten times what you currently earn. If you can continue writing fifteen per day, you will be able to earn fifteen gold coins every day. Is that considered a fortune then? Link eyes brightened with joy and he nodded ecstatically. Of course. What exactly do I have to do? You do not have to do anything extra, 
just continue to produce 15 premium quality magic scrolls every day. Of the 15 you produce, you give me 7 of them and I will replace them with the scrolls I write. Derek was willing to put down his pride and write level 0 magic scrolls for the sake of earning extra income. Furthermore, the order must not be delayed. I guess that's fine. Link took a while before agreeing. Derek obviously had his eyes set on the market value of his scrolls. This cooperation would tie both him and Link into a mutually beneficial contract, the first step in forming a closer relationship and his opening to investigate more into Magician Bale. The first cracks had appeared. Link knew that the day in which he exposed Bale's secret was not far. I will be going back then. Thank you, sir. Link acted uncomfortable. Remember, the ordinary scrolls do not have to be exquisitely written. Those mercenaries will not be able to appreciate it. However, put in more effort for those magic scrolls that you are giving me. Take care of your health and do not overwork yourself. Derek gently reminded. Yes, sir, I'll keep that in mind. Link left Derek's room. Derek could not help but chuckle after Link closed the door behind him. That guy is a treasure. His advancement to a level 3 magician was now fully dependent on Link. It was a silent night. The next day, Derek delivered a stack of high-quality blank magic scrolls and a bottle of expensive golden ink to Link's room. Link also conscientiously wrote magic scrolls in his room and only left when it was 4 in the afternoon. Link first submitted the ordinary scrolls to Warwick, before delivering the high-quality magic scrolls to Derek's room. Derek was already waiting for him. The door opened almost immediately after he knocked. Derek was behind the door with a cheerful and natural smile on his face. You have arrived. These are the completed scrolls, I suppose? Derek set his sights on the stack of scrolls Link was carrying. Yes, sir. Link handed over the stack of scrolls. Please take a rest while I check them. Derek hastily received them and began checking. He opened the first scroll carefully and stared in awe at the work of art that was displayed in front of him. On the thick magic paper colored with a natural light green hue, a mysterious and smooth golden stroke seemed to dance with elegance. A harmonious and clean magic aura also emanated from the scroll. At the sides, Link meticulously pinned down a different, but similarly exquisite pattern. They looked natural and blended in perfectly with the strokes in the middle. The scroll felt weighted and epic. This scroll was nearly perfect. After careful observation, Derek realized that the intricate pattern on the border was not just decorative, but was, in fact, an individual spell. It was a level zero basic stabilizing spell. This would protect the scroll from any damages and the effects would last until the spell disintegrated. If this scroll was bought as a collectible, the spell could greatly lengthen its lifespan and allow it to be passed on for many generations to come as a family heirloom. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Link, you are really a genius. Derek could not help but exclaim. He was initially afraid that Link could not perform up to his standards, but now he was completely at ease. These scrolls could definitely be sold for a high price. Link acted uncomfortable and nodded. Then I will be returning to my room. Wait, here's eight gold coins, your commission for the scrolls. Take them. Derek paid Link up front. He was already sure that the scrolls could be sold for a high price. Link received the gold coins and left the room after politely bowing to Derek. How gullible! Derek was extremely pleased with Link's performance. Little did he know that Link was merely letting him get used to the convenience of such quick money. When he got used to this extravagant lifestyle the magic scrolls were providing him, he would have developed a dependence on Link. Currently. He was like a frog in a pot of warm water slowly brought to boil. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 92, An Offer You Can't Refuse Ten days went by like a breeze, and Link had now produced 150 protective armor magic scrolls, of which more than half was in Derek's name. The military's orders of 800 magic scrolls were completed on schedule as well. Warwick could finally breathe easy now and he was deeply grateful to Link. Warwick had made some progress because of this experience too. 
After 20 days of intense work stretching his own limit by producing a huge number of magic scrolls, he had broken through his progress ceiling and became a full-fledged level 1 magician. He had two options after becoming a full-fledged magician. The first choice was to become an independent magician who would go out and fight in battles, while the second was to continue to stay in the mage tower. Warwick opted for the first choice. Thus, there was a vacancy in the position of the person overseeing the production of magic scrolls. Many apprentices were vying for the position as it came with a lot of perks and boons. Because Derek had the power to appoint anyone to the position, a swarm of apprentices waited at his feet ready to do anything for him. Some female apprentices even threw themselves into his arms and became especially affectionate to him. It was a time when Derek felt he was on top of the world, intoxicated by the unctuous taste of power. However, on the twelfth day, Link suddenly came into Derek's room and handed him fifteen exquisite magic scrolls. Mr. Derek, I want to be the head of the magic scroll production. He whispered. What? Derek was alarmed. It was the first time Link had ever made any special demands. His instinct was to refuse him because he had promised the position to an apprentice named Evelyn. For the simple reason that beautiful girl had promised to be his lover and she would give him whatever he wanted, whenever and wherever he wanted it. His impulse to refuse Link was stunted by the sudden realization that Link's magic scrolls had earned him a fortune. Every day, he brought Link's magic scrolls with him to Springs City and sold them at the price of 10 gold coins each. Not only did they sell out every day, but people flocked to him looking for more of these marvelous scrolls. Link's magic scrolls turned out to be much more popular than he imagined. Moreover, the capital city was never in shortage of rich people. In the last 10 days, Link had brought him thousands of gold coins of income. It was an amount of money he wouldn't even dare to dream about in the past. An hour in his tutor's elemental pool cost a pricely sum of 100 gold coins, but that was not a problem to him anymore, as he now had the money. With Link's magic scrolls he earned nearly 100 gold coins a day, so he could afford to spend half an hour in the elemental pool every day. Because of that, he progressed rapidly and had now mastered a level 2 spell, Large Fireball. Consequently, he was now a level 3 magician. In the eyes of the magicians, nothing was paramount to skills in magic. As a level 3 magician, his colleagues started to treat him with much more respect. This had given Derek far more satisfaction than any woman could through carnal pleasure. Don't worry about it, said Derek. I've decided to appoint you as the man in charge of magic scroll production. I'll announce it publicly tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Derek, said Link, putting on a reverent tone. He then took out another magic scroll. I've recently mastered the level zero light spell and made slight modifications to its structure to improve its aesthetics. This way people can use the spell as an ornament. I'm sure magic scrolls of this spell would sell much better than lesser protective armor scrolls. Although Derek showed no signs of being annoyed by Link's demand just now, he still wanted to make sure there were no hard feelings between them. The magic scroll was a present he prepared for Derek to sweeten the deal. But why did he not just offer the present before he made his demand? Because Link wanted to send a message. He only presented the new magic scroll after Derek had agreed to appoint him to the position that Link desired, hinting that Link would repay him for whatever favor that was given to him. The more requests Derek could satisfy, the more presents he would get. Derek could sense the message Link was trying to give and it left a bad taste in his mouth, though he was determined not to show it since Link had the upper hand in the current situation. And so, Derek suppressed the nagging anger he felt and proceeded to unfold Link's new magic scroll. Derek was startled the instant he opened the scroll, as he was faced with not just simple lines of magic runes, but a horse. A horse carved out by countless lines of flowing mana that looked so real it seemed it might jump out of the scroll at any moment. What was even more striking was how the body of the horse was glowing and the combination of light and shadow conspired to make it look three-dimensional. The eyes of the horse seemed to shine vividly. They were exactly identical to those of a living, breathing horse. What is it? Asked the stupefied Derek. It's a horse, said Link, but it's also the structure of the light spell. I've made some minute changes to enable it to display a more impressive and realistic contrast of light and shadow. I've also used a magic preservation spell on it, so it should last for at least 50 years without fading. 
Just as Link had explained, Derek could finally make out the outlines of the light spell and the structure of the horse. But it was far from the ordinary version of the spell. Link had created something so innovative that no one else would be able to imitate. Derek could already predict how well this magic scroll would be received in Spring City. Marvelous. I won't let these magic scrolls part my hands without getting paid 20 gold coins for each, thought Derek, full of determination. Derek's lacking entrepreneurial skills were obvious from this idea. Any shrewd merchant would know that these scrolls could fetch at least a hundred gold coins each. Of course, Link wouldn't reveal the fact to Derek even if he could hear Derek's current thoughts. After all, producing magic scrolls was, to him, just a way to get closer to Bale. Even if he wanted to start doing it seriously to earn money, he would do it later himself and would definitely not trust a cheapskate like Derek to handle things for him. I'll pay you three gold coins for each magic scroll like this, said Derek, pointing towards the scroll in front of him. His previous animosity towards Link had completely vanished after seeing these magic scrolls. Thank you, Mr. Derek, replied Link, not forgetting to put on a look of joy. When Link left the room, Derek became lost in his train of thoughts. He now realized that Link was more than a simple magician's apprentice. He had a vague feeling that he was falling into a trap set by Link. But the problem was, he felt the trap was so alluring that he himself wasn't willing to escape, as it was brimming with gold coins. The ecstasy he felt from owning a mountain of gold coins that he could spend and squander however he wished was something he wouldn't let go of that easily, even if it meant that he was caught in somebody's trap. That damned kid, he's got me firmly in his hands, cursed Derek. He then got up and left the room to find Emily. He had to appease his new lover. Although he couldn't fulfill his promise to her, he knew the only reason she wanted the position was because she was attracted to the many perks that came with it. And now that he was in no shortage of gold coins, he was confident that she wouldn't stay angry with him for long. What I wouldn't give to have that nice body of hers all to myself, thought Derek now lost in his lustful fantasies. He was so eager to meet his lover that he failed to notice how Link had been observing his every move in a corner. So he's resigned to his fate now, huh? Link could easily read Derek's thoughts just by watching his actions. Derek was like a frog that Link trapped in a pot of cold water, to which he then increased the temperature so slowly that it would not notice any changes in its surroundings until it was too late. Figuratively speaking, Derek was now a boiled frog, no longer a threat, or even a slight obstacle to Link. Link then returned to his own little room. He didn't prepare any magic scroll or read any books. Instead, he started to work on his thesis. The theories in Link's thesis were the basis of his modification of the spell Edelweiss, which he regarded as a great success. This made Link realize the enormous potential of his unfinished thesis, so he became more motivated to work on it now. Today was quite a productive day for him. He had a lot of inspirations for new ways to advance his flow of deductions. He had been working intensely for a full hour before he felt exhausted and unable to focus. Link saw no point in straining himself further, so he put down his quill and picked up a textbook instead. Level 3 spells were still not strong enough for him. Link anticipated the day when the ailing mana effects subsided and his mana would be as high as 1480 points enough to cast level 5 spells. Still, the quality of the spells purchased from the gaming system was just too low. Not only was their power disappointing, the spellcasting speed was too slow as well, which rendered them completely useless in battles. Unless it was absolutely necessary, Link wouldn't waste any more of his Omni points to purchase new spells from the gaming system. From now on, he would learn and master the spells through his own efforts. Learning magic was a complicated business, as the theories got more convoluted and impenetrable, the slower Link had to pace himself through each point and each fact. Nevertheless, his progress had been slow but steady. Time passed, and it was now the dead of night. But in the small space beneath the narrow staircase in Bale's mage tower, the young magician was still hard at work. Meanwhile, Derek was still busy fooling around with his new lover. The genius magician Iliard had already gone to bed after a long day and the angel Herrera was in her own mage tower, enjoying a moment of quiet solitude as she sipped at the sweet dragon wine imported from the south. In a city of pleasure paradise called Melendon in the Southern Free Trade Confederation, a dark-haired girl suddenly gazed up at the night sky. 
In a sea of bright flickering stars, a dazzling meteor swept across the heavens. How are you getting on right now, Link? murmured the beautiful demon princess into the chilly air. A gust of wind blew past her, and the girl pulled up the hood to cover her face as she slithered away quickly into the darkness. Behind her, pursuers kept trying to hunt her down. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 93 Give Me 10 Days The next morning, Derek announced that Link would be in charge of magic scroll production with a gleeful look on his face. He had climbed slightly higher in rank ever since he officially became a level 3 magician. Link had also displayed his talent in writing magic scrolls. Even Warwick, who was going to leave the Mage Tower, also suggested appointing Link as his successor. Therefore, even with some objections on the ground, the appointment was relatively smooth sailing. Warwick then handed over all his responsibilities to Link. As Warwick explained the duties, Link realized two benefits that he would receive. The first was a list of contacts he would be getting. He would be able to directly liaise with the magic scroll merchants without going through a third party. This would be extremely helpful in his future plans to earn more gold coins. Secondly, he would be responsible for the purchase of raw materials and the creation of magic scrolls. This included the entire mage tower ranging from basic to high-level quality materials. Official magicians were usually too prideful to concern themselves with errands like this. Hence, they often let trusted magicians of lower status handle the job. From these lists, Link could obtain a great deal of information about the mage tower. After Warwick was done with the explanation, Link sat down and started reviewing the mage tower's previous purchases. They were recorded in great detail in a thick notebook. He perused through the pages and found what he was looking for within minutes. Warwick bought 30 Tarek cow leather for a total of three times in the past 50 days. This type of leather was only used in the creation of magic scrolls level 5 and above. However, the amount of Tarek cow leather the mage tower was purchasing was nowhere near normal. High-level magic scrolls required huge amounts of magic power and were extremely difficult to produce. A level 6 magician could only create one scroll a month. There was thus no need to purchase 30 of them every month. If they were indeed used to create magic scrolls, there would be an insane number of high-level magic scrolls in Bale's mage tower. However, Bale clearly did not have the energy and time to create these scrolls. Then why did Bale order so much Tarek cow leather? Warwick might be clueless but Link was certain he knew what was going on. The production of Tarek cow leather took place in the Tarek Plains to the west. The leather came from a magical beast indigenous to the area. It was only termed as cow leather simply because of its looks and had, in fact, no connection to cows. These magical beasts had an affinity to water and were resistant to both droughts and floods. Their skin was mainly used to create high-quality scroll paper, though a certain substance could also be extracted from their skin. However, the latter was not known to many people and was rarely used. This substance was known as death glue. It was widely used in undead magic to glue the different body parts together. Despite the fact that Tarek cow leather was already processed by alchemy, death glue could still be extracted from it. He could only determine that Bale was experimenting with dark magic when he saw the dormant forest spirit root in Derek's room. However, with this evidence, he could narrow it down even further to determine that it was undead magic that Bale was experimenting with. Bale, do you really wish to attain immortality? What an idiot! Link gently closed the book and sneered. The only way to become immortal was to become a god. Any other path would inevitably result in the annihilation of your soul. That was, unless the war between dark and light ended in favor of the dark side and the world fell into the control of the dark gods. Only then would necromancers have a chance to shine. Bale clearly did not have the liberty of time to wait until then. He also could not tell what the future held. To think that he would abandon everything and walk on the path of darkness much less trying to cover up his tracks with such juvenile tactics. How foolish! Link tidied up his desk before informing Matt. I will be going out for an hour. Got it, Matt replied. After all, they were not slaves and were allowed to freely move around the academy. Link was careful. In order to not raise suspicion, he first brought the notebook back to his own room and hid it in his dimensional pendant. 
He then walked out of the mage tower barehanded and made a few rounds around the common square before stopping right in front of Herrera's mage tower. He was granted a visit ten minutes later. I have found the evidence. Link wasted no time and took out the notebook he was hiding in his dimensional pendant. Herrera looked through the notebook and asked, It looks perfectly normal, except for the excessive purchase of high-quality scroll raw materials. What does this mean? In the eyes of an ordinary magician, undead magic was forbidden. One was not even allowed to be in contact with it, much less experiment on something so dangerous. Even though knowing thy enemy was undoubtedly a good tactic, the temptation of undead magic is way too strong. This was especially so for those powerful, but old magicians who found it difficult to resist the lure of immortality. Magicians thus had to completely ban the use of this magic. Although Herrera was an awakened angel of light, her knowledge of magic was still limited to what she had learned during her time in the mortal realm. She hence had no knowledge of undead magic and was clueless to the alternative use of Tarek cow leather. This might be the reason why Bale was so daring in his purchase of undead magic raw materials. Link pointed to the Tarek cow leather purchases on the notebook and said, This is the problem. What about it? What is so special? Herrera asked. Her eyes fixated on Link, puzzled as to what kind of problems Link could possibly have found. Link was dumbfounded. Based on his knowledge, he should not know anything about undead magic. The fact that he was aware of such information only had one explanation, and that was he had once read a dark magic book. That was absolutely not allowed. Link immediately had an idea. He calmly explained the special use of Tarek cow leather, the death glue and the fact that the glue could be extracted from the leather even after it was processed. He was extremely detailed. As expected, Herrera asked, How did you know about this? The God of Light told me so. Link played his trump card. I see. Herrera bought his incredulous story. If it were any other magician, Link would have been shot down right on the spot. After all, who would believe such an incredulous story of a god bestowing knowledge onto a layman? However, Herrera was an angel of light, and she firmly believed Link to be the chosen one. There was nothing shocking for divine enlightenment to descend onto the chosen one. Herrera was still troubled. But I cannot report it to Master Anthony. He knows that I have no knowledge of dark magic and will immediately suspect you. He does not believe in divine enlightenment. Link had an idea. That is easy, you can simply confront Bale and expose his secrets. Following which, he will be flustered, resulting in more mistakes and eventually, a solid evidence of his dark magic experiment will surface. The only downside to this plan was its risks. There was a high chance Bale may silence us for the success of his experiments. Herrera simply laughed. Kill me? That is impossible. My magic level might be lower, but he is definitely not my match. The level of a magician was usually taken with a pinch of salt in a battle. If a level 1 magician could cast his spells fast enough and had good battle awareness, he could easily pierce the heart of a powerful magician with a level 1 ice spike spell. If Herrera was so confident, she must have a supreme magical skill trump card in her hands. So what do you think? Link asked. Time is tight, I will settle it now. Herrera agreed and grabbed her sapphire staff, prepared to confront Bale. Wait a minute, Link said. Is there an issue? Can we wait for ten more days? Link brought up a strange request. Why? Herrera was confused. I will have recovered from my weakened state in five days, and I need another five more days to fully replenish my energy. By then, I will have enough power to aid you in the battle. Furthermore, we may find new evidence these next few days. What do you say? Even though Herrera was confident, she was still infringing on someone else's home turf. It was safer to travel with a trusted aide. Herrera thought for a moment and nodded. All right, ten days it is. Herrera was not an impulsive person. She had done her research into Link's background and knew that he was a powerful magician in battle. She would be way more confident with him around. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 94, Black Magic Was No Laughing Matter. 
After leaving Herrera's mage tower, Link circled the grounds of Bryant's inspiration courtyard, making sure he seemed like he was just taking a walk as he always did. Then, he walked back to Bale's mage tower as usual. But when he walked into the tower, he found that there was something different about the atmosphere in the hall. It was eerily quiet, even the usual din of murmurs was missing. But Link looked around and saw that most of the apprentices were there, so what exactly was going on? Why was it so quiet? Link then scanned around the hall more carefully and found the reason for the abnormal silence. Right there beside the semicircular bookshelf was a white-haired old man dressed in a green robe. The old man's face was full of wrinkles, his stature was very thin, and he must have been at least 70 years of age. The mana on his body fluctuated in a very restrained manner, making him seem not very powerful at all, and yet Derek and Darius who stood near the old man both looked especially deferential when they addressed him. That must be the magician Bale. It was Link's first time seeing the disgraced magician since entering the East Cove Magic Academy. He looked much older than he did in the game. In fact, he even seemed weak and frail. His only outstanding features were his eyes which were a deep dark blue, and they exuded a mysterious aura that seemed capable of inadvertently striking terror into a weaker soul. This meant that the old man possessed a formidable power within that shell of a frail body. His body might be old, but his magic was obviously still on point. Bale was surrounded by many magician's apprentices who were posing questions to the official tutor of all apprentices in this mage tower. He wore a kind smile on his face while he patiently answered their questions. Link hurried back to his room before anyone noticed him. Once in his room, he quickly put the record of purchases notebook on the nightstand. Finding out that Link had smuggled the notebook out of the tower would certainly make Bale suspicious of Link, and that would mean disaster. Barely a minute afterwards, someone knocked on his door. Link, come out. The tutor wants to see you. It was Derek's voice. Link was startled, but he managed to regain his composure quickly. I'll be out in a bit, replied Link in a loud and clear voice. As he opened the door, Link saw how every pair of eyes in the hall turned to him. Many of those eyes betrayed signs of admiration and some, jealousy and envy. But there was one stark exception, Bale's chief disciple, Darius, who was standing right beside his tutor. His eyes were staring fixedly at Link with a clear expression of distrust. Link found it curious since he clearly remembered that he hadn't been interacting much with the chief disciple, and yet, Darius seemed to be inexplicably resentful of him, as though they were sworn enemies. I'll just be more careful around him, then. Link thought this wasn't the time to ruminate on such trivial matters. Bale was watching him too, looking very interested in the young apprentice. When Link approached him, Bale greeted him amiably. Young man, I have seen your magic scrolls, said Bale, they are indeed remarkable. I am honored to have such a talented young man as my apprentice in my twilight years. If you are willing, you may remain as my disciple in this tower once you've become a full-fledged magician. Just as those words left Bale's lips, the whole hall erupted into gasps and suppressed mutterings. No one admired Link now. Everyone had become envious of the lucky new apprentice, some even resented Link at this point. Bale enjoyed a high reputation in the kingdom of Norton. He was widely respected as a veteran master magician among magicians in the kingdom. Although these apprentices had been learning magic in Bale's tower, they've never actually been taught by Bale himself. And yet, who would have thought that this newcomer Link would suddenly be noticed by the tutor and was even invited to stay on after becoming a full-fledged magician by the man himself? Some apprentices found it simply unacceptable and unfair. What aggravated the matter was the fact that Link's own mana strength was so low. Had he been accepted by the tutor because of his strength, they would have conceded to the decision. But all Link could do was create beautiful magic scrolls. If Link's innate mana wasn't strong enough, while he might be able to become a full-fledged magician, he would never be able to rise above level, too. What was so impressive about producing nice-looking magic scrolls when he was stuck at being a level, 2 magician? Why would Bale take notice of such a weakling? Even so, none of the apprentices dared to voice their displeasure. It was Bale's mage tower after all, so his words were the law. No one had the guts to challenge any of Bale's decisions. Even Link himself was shocked by Bale's announcement. He never thought that such a thing would happen. 
As he looked up his eyes were met with Bale's own extraordinary pair. For a few moments, both were staring deep into each other's eyes. Link's eyes were deep and impenetrable, while Bale's eyes were naturally emitting a dignified aura. In the brief moment that they made eye contact, their different spiritual forces inadvertently collided. Seconds later, Link lowered his eyes and with a joyful expression said, Thank you, Tudor. Bale blinked unwittingly, and his brows were slightly raised. He had decided to accept the young apprentice as his disciple because he was impressed by his extraordinary magic scrolls. Compared to the other apprentices, Link's skill in creating magic scrolls was indeed spectacular. However, what had really caught Bale's eyes was Link's masterful control of mana, especially after hearing how Link could engage in such an intense activity as producing magic scrolls for many days in a row. Being able to tirelessly produce magic scrolls for many consecutive days proved that Link possessed a powerful soul, and this was one of the essential qualities of a great magician. Link's weak mana was not a problem at all because he was still very young. Bale believed that there will be a great development in his innate mana in the future. Throughout history, there had been numerous great talents who were late bloomers, so a case like Link was not an uncommon one. Although it was true that the old man had started to delve into the dark art of black magic, his original intention had only been to lengthen his own life. Bale was not an evil man at all. When he discovered a way to guarantee an excellent afterlife for himself, he was naturally delighted, and wanted to find out precisely how he could attain it. However, after looking into Link's dark pair of eyes, Bale couldn't help but feel a little bit unnerved. He was now sure that Link's soul was very powerful, but in that brief interaction, he'd found that Link's soul might be so powerful that even he could be overwhelmed by its immense force. It simply made no sense how such a powerful soul could possess such a weak level of mana. Bale had to satisfy his curiosity, so he carefully observed Link again and again. Yet Link never showed the same fierce power he did before and he was now just a normal reverend apprentice no matter how many times Bale examined him. Was I just imagining it? Bale wondered. In the past, Bale wouldn't let such trivial thoughts linger on in his mind. He wouldn't bat a second eye to it and would completely forget it in a matter of seconds. But those were simpler times when he had nothing to hide. He couldn't afford to be so carefree now because he was now plagued by a guilty conscience. He was concealing a terrible secret that he couldn't let anyone find out. Therefore, any minute details that were out of place would trigger his suspicion nowadays. I was too reckless just now, Bale thought. I should have checked the apprentice's background more thoroughly before I make any hasty decisions. Because of the unruly doubts in Bale's mind fueled by his dark secrets, his readiness to accept Link as his new disciple had been cut in half. Bale did not realize that although he had dipped his toes into black magic with the initial intention of extending his life, the insidious nature of black magic was no laughing matter. It had planted three treacherous demons in Bale's heart, constant doubt, fear of exposure, and eternal greed. Under the efforts of these three demons, the qualities he possessed in the realm of light rapidly collapsed without him knowing it. Then, Bale seemed to forget what he had just said. His attitude toward Link changed drastically and he stopped talking to him completely. He stayed in the hall for a while longer, doing and saying nothing. After a while he suddenly turned to Darius, one of his most trusted disciples, and said, I'm tired now. Let's go back upstairs. When you're free later, Tell Link to move out from his room and arrange for him to stay in a new room on the second floor. Yes, Tudor, replied Darius respectfully. Bale then stood up, and Darius hurriedly stepped forward to support his tutor's body. They then headed for the stairs and climbed up to the top of the mage tower. Darius, what do you think of Link? Asked Bale suddenly. They'd reached the third floor and no one else was around. I don't know much about him, answered Darius, he used to be very quiet, and his progress had been average. Had it not been for the military's order for magic scrolls, I wouldn't have known that he had such a great talent for magic scrolls. I hear Derek is close to him, so he should know more about Link than I do. Darius gave a very objective response to the question and he made sure not to mix in any of his personal feelings. But Bale knew his disciple very well. When he heard Darius's tone as he spoke of Link, his face crumpled into a frown. So you don't like him, huh? Asked the master magician. 
This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 95, Threats from the Chief Disciple Bale's Mage Tower Darius looked at the ground and shook his head, no, Link is an exceptional apprentice, it's just, too sudden. Master, I do not know how to explain this feeling of abruptness, it is almost as if this was deliberately planned. Deliberate? Planned? These two words struck fear into Bale's heart. Many images flashed through his mind. Could it be that someone has discovered my secret? Link was recommended by my old friend Duke Abel, there should not be a problem, but Dara's sixth sense had always been accurate. If he sensed that something was amiss, the chances were that he was right. After a few moments of silence, Bale spoke, since I have decided to take Link as my disciple, I have the right to better understand his background. Help me do some research and report back to me as soon as possible. Yes, sir, Darius nodded, if there is indeed a problem, what should I do? Bale listened and shook his head, report to me before you do anything. Do not act rashly. Darius then escorted Bale back to his room and immediately returned to the ground floor to look for Link. Let's go, I'll bring you to your new room. Darius was cold towards Link. Okay. Link nodded and followed closely behind. Under the envious vision of all the other magician's apprentices, the two of them climbed up the swirling stairs and stopped in front of the outermost room on the second floor. Darius did not open the door immediately, but instead, stood in front of the door and stared at Link, Link, there are many secrets in this world, but we do not have to know all of them, especially those that will not cause harm to others, am I right? Link was shocked at Darius' awareness of his secretive actions but he still managed to keep his cool. He replied with a confused tone, Sir, I don't understand what you are talking about. Darius sniggered and lowered his voice, you know exactly what I am talking about. I know the notebook that is used to record purchases of raw materials for magic scrolls is missing. After asking around, I realize you are the one that is in charge of keeping it safe. I also know that you got this position in return for writing magic scrolls for Derek. You probably have a motive, going to such means to get what you want. You must be investigating on my master, and shall I make a guess that you have already found some evidence? Link looked at Darius, clearly bewildered and at a loss for words. When Link found the evidence in the notebook, he was sneering at Bale's failure to cover up his tracks. The sensitivity and accuracy of Darius' accusations was thus something he did not expect. Link looked as though he was frozen in time. Please let this go. My master has not fallen and he will never cause harm to others. Darius stared hard at Link with a slight murderous intent. He seemed ready to engage in a fight if Link were to refuse. The real reason why Darius was able to pinpoint Link's intentions so accurately was purely coincidental. Link had been performing exceptionally well amongst the apprentices and had caught his attention from a while ago. Darius was thus observing him with keen interest. However, Link's consistent exceptional performance turned his curiosity into vigilance. This was especially so after Link became the person in charge of magic scroll production. Darius was fully aware of Bale's experiments into black magic. He was, in fact, a competent assistant to his master. Bale was getting old and did not have as much vigor as before. When he was fully focused on his research, he often failed to cover up the tracks of his ventures into the area of black magic. On the other hand, Darius was young and vigilant. He knew very well that the notebook definitely held evidence of his master's experiments. If anyone were to express interest in the contents of that notebook, there was a high chance that he was here to investigate on his master. Darius was only surprised that the person tasked with such a dangerous mission was of such tender age and had little to no magic powers. While Darius was sorting out his thoughts, Link had also figured out the episodes that could have ignited Darius' suspicion. Darius might have been right about his intentions, however he lacked concrete evidence to prove it. Before then, it could only be dismissed as a conjecture. This also meant that Darius' views could still be easily changed by what he saw and felt. Link hence decided to stay true to his original statement, Sir Darius, I still do not understand. I truly hope so. I was an orphan and it was Master Bale who raised me as a child and taught me magic. He is like a father to me. Anyone who tries to hurt my master will have to first step over my dead body. 
Darius was extremely confident that Link was a spy. Darius called out his light green rune staff and a warm glow enveloped the tip of his staff. Before long, the corridors were shaking and getting distorted, it felt as though they were in the midst of a heat wave. This was the power of a level for magician. If an ordinary magician's apprentice were to witness this scene, he would be petrified with fear. However, Link had way too much battle experience for this tactic to be effective. He knew, for one, that he could not let this confrontation develop into an all-out battle. It would be for the best if a master magician like Bale dabbling in the arts of black magic was settled quietly. Link thus had to find a way to stabilize Darius' emotions and convince him that his conjecture was incorrect. As long as Darius started to doubt himself, he would be able to buy more time to react to this unexpected confrontation. Link hence put on an act to be traumatized by Darius' display of magic power. He made sure to tremble while slightly stammering, Sir Darius, I understand. I will definitely remember your words. Also, I am really not investigating anything. The notebook has always been in my room, if you want to take a look I can always pass it to you. Link had a fearful and dazed expression when speaking. He looked like he was clueless about what was happening. You are a smart person, Darius nodded. Link seemed genuine enough. He might have really made a mistake by accusing Link of such an act. After all, Link might just be a talented magician making detailed plans for his future. Pass me the notebook now. Darius would erase all evidence. Link immediately ran to his old room to retrieve the notebook. After receiving the notebook, Darius spoke sternly, no one has to know about what happened today, understand? Yes, I totally understand. Link nodded hastily. That's good. Now please enjoy staying in your new room. Darius pushed the door open and handed the room key to Link. Link took the key and ran off swiftly. He looked terrified. Darius started to believe he could have been misguided. Link might really just be an ordinary apprentice. However, there was no way he could continue staying in this mage tower after what happened today. He had to find a way to get him out. And the moment he leaves, Darius' eyes shone with a bladed resolve. The secret must be safe. Master is getting old and way too kind. Certain things require a clean break. Darius would take no chances. If his master's reputation went down the drain, so would his future. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 96, Playing with Fire. In Bale's Mage Tower. After receiving threats from Darius, Link made sure to keep under the radar and did nothing that might arouse suspicions. In recent days, he did not interact with anyone, nor did he even contact Herrera and Eliard. Instead he stayed cooped up in his room all day and all night, ostensibly to prepare magic scrolls. He'd been consistently producing 15 first-rate magic scrolls a day, and all of them were handed to Derek to manage. He got three gold coins for each of them, thus earning 45 gold coins a day. From the sales of magic scrolls alone, Link had so far earned nearly 300 gold coins. But wealth wasn't the only thing he gained recently. Because he didn't have to worry about his safety once he was inside the academy, coupled with the adequate nutrition he got every day, the regular intervals of work and rest and his young age, Link had now also gained considerable weight. He no longer seemed so frail and thin, but had actually grown quite muscular, nicely filling out the tall and lanky stature that he had previously. All in all, Link now looked more pleasing to the eye than he ever did. And so, five days passed with no incidents. On the fifth morning, Link felt his body was completely rejuvenated to a point where he felt he was at a different plane of existence. His consciousness and perceptions had now become unusually acute. He could even hear the spider weaving its web in the corner of the room and the whistling breeze blowing through the window. He could feel the various elements flowing in the air so vividly he could almost see it with his naked eye. These were the effects of elemental sight. It was an ability that a magician naturally developed once their power advanced to a certain extent. Check body statistics. Once the thought emerged in his mind, there was a flash on the interface. Link Morani, Nobleman. Level, 3 Elite Magician. Rate of mana restoration, 5 points per hour. Maximum mana, 660 points. 
Current mana, 150 points. Weapon, Matchstick Wand. Current status, Ailing mana effect subsiding. Just as I expected. After three long months, the Ailing mana effects were finally going to be over. The process of the Ailing mana effect subsiding would last a full day, and in every hour, Link's maximum mana would gradually become higher and higher. However, because his mana restoration rate was so slow, his mana could only recover 9.8 points per hour even under ideal conditions. So even though his maximum mana was continuously increasing, his mana still needed more time to catch up, so he had to be patient and not do anything rash. At 8 o'clock in the evening, the ailing mana effects finally disappeared completely. By then, Link's maximum mana was at 1480 points, and his current mana was at 220 points. In order to completely restore his strength, Link had to wait more than 130 hours, which was more than 5 days. My mana restoration speed is too damn sluggish, Link lamented. He knew that a magician with decent mana strength and talents would only need a day of absolute rest to completely replenish their mana, yet he needed 6 long days to do the same. He realized that his mana restoration rate was the biggest stumbling block to his progress. Link was carefully considering the best strategies to take while lying in his bed. Finally, he chose to spend his Omni points, which were currently at 125 points. 70 Omni points to increase the mana restoration rate, he silently thought. Then, a dialog box popped up on the interface. Confirm? Confirm, replied Link. Suddenly, Link felt a heat rising from inside his body. It felt as if something had exploded. Soon after the initial burst, a stream of heat then flowed rapidly to his extremities and he felt numb in every spot that was touched by the heat. Moments afterwards, the numbness turned into stinging pain and then the stinging pain morphed into excruciating pain. The pain was so unbearable that Link couldn't hold in his groans and beads of sweat began to form on his forehead, which then dripped down his face in streams. What was going on? Link was petrified. He had only chosen to increase his mana restoration speed, so why was he suffering such a frightening level of pain? Nothing like this had ever happened before. Then, a notification popped up on the interface. It was an explanation from the gaming system. Player's choice has exceeded the innate talent limit of the physical body. Gaming system is currently modifying player's physical body to accommodate the new changes. Innate talent limit? Link had never heard of the term before. The gaming system then provided a vivid metaphor to explain. The physical body is like a bucket and mana is like the water inside it. There is an inlet and an outlet on the bucket, and the limit for the physical body's inlet is 30 mana points per hour, while the outlet's limit is 500 mana points per hour. The moment these limits are exceeded, the system must modify the bucket to adapt to the current changes, and this process can cause pain to the player. Link got it now. Looking at the data that the gaming system just provided, Link's body must have had a pretty low innate talent limit. Link estimated that it wouldn't have been possible for him to rise any higher than level 5. At present, a level 5 magician might sound impressive, but in the future when there was a drastic increase in the concentration of mana in the environment, a level 5 magician was nothing more than a mediocre magician. Strength always came with its own price. Since there was no other way to advance other than to transform this body, Link had no other choice but to grit his teeth and endure the pain. It felt as if there were countless blades of knives stabbing him from within. His body was trembling madly in response to the pain, yet Link sunk his teeth into his blanket and suffered through the pain without making a peep of sound. The ordeal went on for more than four hours, and when those blades finally stopped stabbing, Link was soaking in sweat and he came very close to collapsing. Still, he managed to cast a cleaning spell on his body, then he took some snacks that Lucy had prepared for him out from his storage pendant. After filling his stomach, Link then went to bed and fell into a deep dreamless sleep. The next moment he came to, it was already dawn. Once he opened his eyes, Link clearly felt the surging mana in his body. His maximum mana was now 1480 points, and his mana restoration rate was now 79.8 points per hour. He checked his pocket watch and found out that he had slept for 15 hours, so his mana must be full by now. Right now, if Link didn't suppress a portion of his mana, 
there would be a frightening flux of mana around his body that would rival even the one that Darius emanated. Finally, he could once again cast the level for spell flame blast that he purchased in Gladstone a few months ago. Link rose from the bed and changed into a brand new gray robe. He cast a mirror spell and used it to tidy up his appearance. Then, Link walked out of his room with a strong resolve in his mind. It was 10 o'clock this morning and when he reached the first floor, Link saw the simple and honest Matt Hard at work preparing a magic scroll as usual. Matt, I'm going out for a while, said Link casually. Uh huh, replied Matt, more as a reaction than a response. He was still focused on his magic scroll. He must not be distracted or else the magic scroll in his hands would turn into trash. Link left the mage tower and headed straight towards the glory square near the gates of the academy. There, he then hailed a carriage. To River Cove Town, please, he said, after paying the coachman handsomely. Magician's apprentices were required to present their tutor's permission letter before they could leave the academy. Link had brought with him a permission letter that Herrera had prepared for him previously. The coachman glanced at the letter, then eagerly received the gold coins and swiftly struck his whip. Very soon after, the carriage started to move and left the gates of the East Cove Magic Academy. Link was going to fetch the Domingo Crystal. A month's time had passed, and the crystal was now purified and ready to be used again. Once he acquired the crystal, he would then possess a combative strength that no ordinary magician could even dream of. Meanwhile, in Bale's Mage Tower. Shortly after Link left, Darius went to the main hall on the first floor. He had just got back from outside and he looked anxious and hurried, as if some emergency had occurred. As soon as he reached the hall, he walked straight to the group of apprentices who were preparing magic scrolls. Coincidentally it was Matt that he approached. Where's Link? Darius demanded. Matt was jolted out of his deep concentration as he was working on the most critical structure of the magic scroll. He stared helplessly as the magic scroll that he had spent so much effort on failed before his eyes. He was so devastated he was about to cry, and yet he dared not raise his voice or lose his temper with Darius. He went out, answered Matt in a deflated tone. Out? Where did he go? He didn't say. Damn it! Spat Darius, before rushing out of the tower in a flurried state. These past few days, Darius had been snooping around to dig out as much information as he could about Link. The more he knew of the young apprentice, the more worried he got. Link was beyond any doubt a spy who was sent to investigate his tutor, Bale. Moreover, this kid was no ordinary magician's apprentice, but was in fact a level 2 magician. He looked for Link everywhere until he finally got to the stable near the Square of Glory. He found a coachman, then pointed his wand at his heart and coldly asked, there was a young magician leaving the academy just now. Do you know where he was headed? This coachman was so afraid he was nearly out of breath, but in the end he managed to answer, yes, yes, I remember him. He said he was heading to River Cove Town. Darius then climbed into the carriage. To River Cove Town, then. And make it quick. He barked at the coachman. This was his best chance to eliminate Link now that he was out in the Gervant Forest. It wasn't an uncommon thing for a lone magician's apprentice to be robbed and killed in such a place where rogues and bandits lurked behind every bush. You are bold for a level, two magician. Don't you know that you're playing with fire? Darius knew that the situation was now approaching the boiling point. He was sure that Link had sneaked out to the River Cove town to report on his tutor's secrets and expose everyone involved. Darius must do whatever it took to stop him. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 97, Cultivate Your Strength The Gervant Forest was still as inviting and peaceful as ever. The warm sun rays that shone through the dense overgrowth gently caressed all the souls of the living passing through. After a period of deceit and vigilance living in Bale's mage tower, Link felt exceptionally invigorated by the bright and tranquil Gervant Forest. Everything he saw pleased his eyes, even the suspicious people he saw and believed to be bandits. He ignored them and continued on his journey. The carriage reached River Cove Town after an hour. River Cove Town was still as crowded and harmonious as before. There were people experiencing hangovers right outside the hotel, 
The market was packed with people, and the town hall notice board still had a bunch of notices posted all over it. The house of the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries lay right at the corner of the town. The yard looked different. It covered a larger surface area now, and had a lot more wooden houses at its side. Another yard enclosed by a wooden fence had also been built in the forest behind their original yard. Their home was a lot more crowded than before. Faces unfamiliar to Link could be seen entering their home. A flag had also been erected at the entrance, depicting a picture of a soaring flamingo. Lucy had been writing to inform him of the situation back at home. Link knew that the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries had been recruiting. They had already gotten more than 20 new members into their band. The carriage stopped right in front of the house and attracted the attention of many onlookers. After all, it was not every day that you could see a carriage bearing the crest of the East Cove Higher Magic Academy arriving in River Cove Town. They were all expecting to see an old magician walking out of the carriage. Link had grown during his time at the Mage Tower and no longer looked as frail as before. He was wearing a brand new robe and with a staff in his hand, he looked just like an official magician. Link and Lucy had already been drawn out of the house by the crowd of onlookers. Why did you return without informing us? Lucy was slightly surprised. She took a good look at Link and was relieved. It seemed like life in the Mage Tower had been kind to him. I came back to pay a visit. Hey, is this young girl a new member too? The first person that caught Link's attention when he walked into the yard was a beautiful young girl practicing her archery skills. A young girl with flawless skin and delicate features would definitely stand out when placed within a group of burly men. She had mediocre archery skills. However, she was indeed blessed with good looks, like a flower waiting for its time to bloom. Gildan laughed. I was telling you, my lord would definitely notice out little Riley when he comes back. He then proceeded to introduce the background of the young girl. Riley is from the Southern Free Districts. She was brought here by the slave vendors and was actually bound for Hot Springs City. Lucy took pity on her and bought her from the slave vendor. You have no idea how much this girl cost us. 100 gold coins. How expensive. Gildern was obviously displeased that such a fortune was spent on a young girl. If not for her good looks, he would never have agreed to let Lucy purchase her. They were not Samaritans with a lot of money to spare, but merely mercenaries who were working hard to get a good life. Lucy was embarrassed. She knew that 100 gold coins was not a small amount and looked at Link uneasily, afraid that she would be told off. When she first saw Riley in the market, her instinctive reaction was to immediately save her from her cruel fate. Lucy could almost see the shadows of her past on Riley's expression. She was certain that the young girl would end up as a concubine of a rich perverted old man in Hot Springs City if she did not intervene. The young girl might be favored by the man for a short while, but the moment the old man got tired of her looks, there was no knowing what would happen to her. Lucy thought about the similar encounters she had previously and shuddered. She could not bear to let this innocent young girl suffer the same fate. Hence, she disregarded the consequences and helped her almost immediately when she knew she had the ability to. She did not regret her decision. To everyone's surprise, the smile on Link's face only grew wider. He ignored their incessant chatters and circled around the young girl, observing her from head to toe with an almost invasive gaze. Gildern could not help but scratched his nose and whispered to Lucy, I think Link likes this girl. From the moment he met Link, Link had never shown any interest in women. This held true even for Lucy, who had good looks and a voluptuous body. However, it seemed that Link was just waiting for the right person. Lucy felt a wave of jealousy overwhelming her and harshly rebutted. Shut your mouth! Riley was extremely nervous. She knew that Link was a magician and judging from the respectful way everyone treated him, he was definitely the leader of the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries. She stopped her archery training the moment she noticed Link's presence. She held the small wooden bow with her pale white hands, hanging her head low and averting direct eye contact with Link. She was like a frightened and confused deer awaiting the judgment of fate. After observing for a full minute, Link even started touching the young girl. He first gently touched her forehead, before moving on to the arms and back. He even unapologetically felt her legs and hips. Link's actions looked extremely perverted. Furthermore, he had a strange expression on his face. 
Gildern was at a loss for words. My lord is acting weird today. Was the lack of the opposite gender in the Magic Academy too much for him to bear? Meanwhile, Lucy thought, my lord is not this type of person, he must have found something. I have always thought Rylai was special. That was also another reason why Lucy was so insistent on purchasing Rylai. Rylai was now on the verge of tears, and did not dare to even budge. When Link's finger made contact with her body, she felt a certain force entering her body as well. This made her extremely uncomfortable, but she was too petrified to move away. Finally, Link withdrew his hand and nodded. Lucy, your money was well spent. This girl has great magic potential. Gildan's eyes widened in shock. Humans with magic potential were extremely rare. To think that Lucy was so lucky. After rationalizing for a moment, Gildern concluded. Well, only special individuals are born with such pretty features. Lucy, you have good judgment. Really? I only thought she was slightly special. Lucy was elated. It was not worthwhile to purchase a beautiful young girl for 100 gold coins, but to purchase a talented child with magic potential for that amount of money, that was a bargain. Link nodded. Lucy had a bit of magical flair herself as well, that was perhaps why she found Rylai special. Originally, Link was planning to teach Lucy magic. However, Lucy was already 28 years old and had no interest in the complex and dry magic theories. On the other hand, Rylai looked no older than 15 years old, the perfect age for someone to pick up magic. She also had more potential than Lucy, this was fate. The moment Link saw Rylai at the corner of the yard, he was amazed at the number of water elementals surrounding her. She seemed to have a body that naturally attracted water element particles causing her surroundings to be filled with 50% more elemental energy. Link was also not taking advantage of Rylai when he started touching her body. He was using mana detection to look into the elemental gates in her body. He realized that water elementals naturally existed in her elemental gates, and that in every gate there were flowing streams of natural mana. This was exceptional talent for water elemental magic. If he successfully imparted his knowledge to this young girl, she would turn out to be an amazing magician with a niche in water elemental magic. As they continued on their journey, they would only meet stronger opponents. In their last battle, Link was already struggling to perform as the only magician of the group. He had long wanted to recruit another talented magician. Hence, he decided to take Rylai as a disciple. You shall be my main disciple. Link chuckled. At that moment, another carriage pulled up at the entrance of River Cove Town. Darius alighted from the carriage. You may return. Darius signaled the carriage to leave. He then cast an illusion spell on himself to disguise as a traveler, asking any passerby he could find. Hi, I am looking for magician Link. Do you know where he is? Darius had done his research. Link seemed to be slightly famous around this area. Most of River Cove Town should have heard of his name. What a coincidence, he just returned from the Magic Academy and is currently at the house of the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries. Darius got the exact location after asking the third person. Thank you? Darius nodded. He did not go straight to the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries. His research had revealed that there was no one stronger than Link in that group. The mastermind that instructed Link to spy on his master could not have been there. More importantly, he could not start a fight with Link in the middle of River Cove Town. That had way too many implications. If he were asked to explain his actions to the Academy, he would be at a loss for words. I will strike during your return trip to the Academy. Darius walked along the King's Lane for five miles before hiding himself in the overgrowth. His plan was simple. He would catch Link alive and force him to reveal the mastermind behind this investigation. Darius naturally expected Link to resist. However, Link was merely a level 2 magician. He would utterly crush him with his level 4 spells. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 98 The Turning Point of a Girl's Fate Part 1 That day, he stretched out his hand and pulled me out of the swamps of my fate, Frost Queen Rylai Gasling, at the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries headquarters. Link was naturally unaware that he was dragged into someone's secret schemes. In this cabin, he was surrounded by loyal followers who all respected him and even revered him, so he let his guard down completely here. 
Upon noticing that the beautiful girl was so frightened that she couldn't move a muscle, Link used the magician's hand to gently take the small wooden bow from her hands and place it on a weapon shelf near him. Then, he took out a short wooden stick that was engraved with a web of silver magic runes. It was a basic wand and it could enhance the power of spells by about 20%. He had created it from scratch when he first started learning the art of enchantment. Link then handed the wand to the stunned girl. A bow and arrow doesn't suit you, he told her. From today onwards, you'll learn magic with me. The girl was in awe. Her bright eyes suddenly widened to the size of saucers. She couldn't believe what she just heard. Riley stared at the wand that Link handed her but didn't dare stretch her hand out to reach it. My lord, is it true? The girl heard herself saying, her voice as quiet as a mosquito. Learning magic required a lot of money. Only the aristocrats had the resources needed to do it. She never imagined that one day a mighty magician would be willing to accept her as a disciple and give her a wand as soon as they met. It's a real magic wand. When she was nine years old, her father had taken her to the southern free paradise of Melendon. There they passed by a shop run by a magician. At that moment, the young Riley gazed into the shop, only to see a well-dressed magician arranging a pile of golden coins into neat rows on the table. There must have been more than thirty gold coins there, yet the only thing he bought was a single magic scroll. Her father had seen it too, and she remembered how he had turned away from the sight of such unimaginable wealth in regret and sorrow. This incident had left a deep impression on her young mind. Since then, she had assumed that all things related to magic were settled in gold coins. She was born in an ordinary trader's family. It was impossible for someone like her to reach such heights. In fact, her father had once told her that even the cheapest magic wands cost more than 50 gold coins. Their family's income, even at their most prosperous, was no more than 15 gold coins a year. And yet, right now, this strange man with a gentle smile on his face had offered to teach her magic and give her an expensive wand. It was all so incredible that she had to pinch herself to make sure she wasn't dreaming. Take it. It belongs to you now. Link insisted. The beautiful girl was as timid as a rabbit, so Link made sure he spoke only in the gentlest tone to her and even remembered to put on a smile. He then placed the wand into the girl's hands. As he did so, he noticed how even her hands were so delicate and lovely. Each of her fingers was as long and slender like the green tops of a spring onion. Her hands were so fair and so soft that Link felt sorely tempted to hold them in his own and caress them gently. Such a lovely girl, how could she not be famous in the game? Link wondered. But when he thought of it, he could understand why the girl wouldn't appear in the game at all. Had it not been thanks to Lucy's intervention, she would have been sold to a rich man in Spring City as a slave. The beautiful yet completely powerless girl would be treated as the rich merchant's goods that could be bought and sold by anyone who was willing to pay the price. Link was sure that the girl wouldn't survive such a life for long, though, and she would have died after two or three years and end up buried in someone's garden with no name to her grave. Riley herself still couldn't believe that any of this was true. Link's assurance had finally given her the courage, and though she hesitated for a while, she finally closed her hand around the wand. The moment the wand touched her hand, she felt an inexplicable affinity to it, and she clasped the wand to her bosom as if embracing an old friend. In her eyes, this ordinary wand was as powerful as a king's scepter. Her body trembled slightly, and she tried her best to hold the wand steadily in her hand. The wand was light and the runes on it glowed in a mysterious aura. This was a fateful moment in her life, as she was about to take her first step into the mysterious world of magic. A month ago, her parents were killed and she was taken by the slave traders to the north. She felt that her whole world had collapsed. She thought of her father day and night, and she often secretly shed tears for her own miserable destiny. She had lost all hope then. But two weeks ago, Lucy had rescued her and brought her here. It was as if the glorious Lord of Light had given her a blessing after suffering a harsh fate. She began to practice archery in the hope of becoming a mighty mercenary and one day, she hoped she would seek vengeance for her parents. But ever since her infancy, she had been cherished and brought up tenderly and lovingly by her parents. She never had to do anything that would require her to exert any energy, so her body had always been very weak. She was only strong enough to handle the smallest bow. 
Although she practiced hard every day until the skin on the palms of her hands peeled, and her shoulder was so sore she couldn't raise her arm, her progress was still negligibly small. If it hadn't been for Lucy, she might now be the lowest maid in the household. But she couldn't rely on Lucy forever. She resolved that if she was unable to develop any strength that would be useful to the group, she would concede to be a maid or a servant. Then she would bury all her dreams of strength and revenge. But just as she felt very confused about the future, she was bestowed with a chance to learn powerful magic. She did not know how to describe her luck. Link laughed and joked as he usually did, as if he'd done nothing special at all. I'm hungry. Is lunch ready yet? He asked Lucy. One moment, my lord, said Lucy in a warm tone. She then went into the kitchen. Now that Link was back, she wanted to prepare the food for him herself. Under the respectful gaze of each new member, Link walked into the cabin, but after walking a few steps, he turned back and waved his hand and said to the girl, Let's go, kid! Ryla was nervously picking at her lips, but as soon as she heard Link's voice, her body seemed to automatically follow his orders and she quickly got up and followed Link's footsteps. He's the master who will teach me magic. I must follow him closely, thought the girl. Ryla didn't mind how Link called her a kid at all, and neither did anyone else in the mercenary band. Although Link himself looked to be about 17 or 18 years old, but his strength was clear to everyone there. All of them looked up to Link regardless of their age. Meanwhile, Link was talking to Gildern in the cabin. Where's Jacker? He asked. Someone found some information about the cliff of howling winds, answered Gildern. So he went with them to check it out. He should be back after three days. Oh, good. Link didn't worry about Jacka's safety. He was a level four warrior, and he had magic gear with him. He even had the experience of fighting against a magician. So even if he did encounter Felidia, Link was sure that Jacka could retreat safely and come back in one piece. Then it was time for lunch. The food was so delicious that Link savored each bite. Once he was full, Link turned to Rylai who was still very tense. I want to rest for a while, he told her. Come and find me in my room two hours from now. Yes, my lord, replied the girl, nodding earnestly. No, don't address me as my lord, corrected Link, gently tapping his wand on the girl's smooth forehead. From today onwards, I shall be your magic tutor. Link wore a gentle smile on his face and had a warmth in his tone when he was speaking to Rylai. Yes, tutor. Rylai responded, she was beginning to open up to Link. She glanced up at Link's face and saw that her tutor was a very young man who couldn't be more than a few years older than her. Although he wasn't strikingly handsome, his dark eyes were clear and very enigmatic. Rylai thought they looked like a pair of black diamonds. Suddenly she realized that she was rudely staring at Link for too long, so she quickly lowered her head while the exquisite face of hers blushed in embarrassment. This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 99, The Turning Point in Her Fate, Part 2 The young girl was humble and respectful. These were two of the most important traits of a good disciple. Link was content and went back to his room. Following which, he used a shaping spell to unseal the path to the attic and retrieve his Domingo crystal that was laying in the clear vat of water. After a month, the Domingo crystal had been completely purified and looked just like a transparent prism. However, that was all. There was nothing out of the ordinary about its looks. No one would imagine that this was a legendary tool that could make any magician go insane. Ha, I guess true beauty lies on the inside. Link was extremely pleased. Link then began to cast a glass orb spell. Through the use of this spell, he was able to concentrate the fire elementals in the surroundings. He then transferred the accumulated magical energy into the Domingo crystal, causing the crystal to glow in a dreamy white light. Link stopped short of releasing the glass orb, gradually accumulating fire elemental energy. All of this energy was indiscriminately absorbed into the dreamy glow of the crystal. The Domingo crystal was like a sponge for magic energy. After a while, Link stopped the transfer of energy, and the phenomenal dreamy glow of white light instantaneously disappeared. The Domingo crystal was now enveloped by a slightly reddish hue. Link then spent 320 mana points to cast a level 4 flame blast spell. 
The Domingo crystal shone with a clear crimson glow after the transfer of energy this time. A message appeared in Link's field of vision. Fire Domingo crystal. Capacity, 15% filled. To be only 15% filled after housing a level 4 spell, it really does have a huge capacity. Link thought. A flame blast spell should be enough to deal with Magician Bale. There was no need to overextend the capacity of the Domingo Crystal and waste any more mana points. Furthermore, it was a good habit to always keep his mana more than halfway filled for any emergencies. This was especially true for Link, who had many enemies. Link then placed the Domingo Crystal back into the dimensional pendant. Two hours later there was a knock on his door. Link glanced at his watch and opened the door with a magician's hand spell. The door creaked open and a young Rylai sheepishly stood behind the door with a basic staff in her hands. Come in. Link waved his hand. Rylai was extremely nervous and inched forward. Once she entered the room, Link closed the door behind her using the magician's hand. The sound caused by the closing door made her jump in fear, causing her to advance even slower. Magic was mysterious and powerful. Rylai knew that Link had unimaginable power from the stories she had heard since she entered the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries two weeks ago. She knew that Link consecutively defeated two groups of syndicate bandits from the Dark Brotherhood. His magic was akin to a sword of judgment, feared and respected by all. Though Link was only a few years older than her, Rylai felt unexplainable pressure just from standing in front of him. This was especially so now that they were alone in an enclosed space. She felt like she was facing a ferocious beast who was prepared to tear her into pieces the moment she let her guard down. Link chuckled at Rylai's reaction. Whenever he displayed magic in front of a layman, he could always evoke this expression of fear and respect. Link adjusted his seating position and lay casually in his chair. He then spoke in a comforting tone. Do you know what is magic? No, no. Rylai could not complete her sentence, she was way too nervous. It can be said to be the brightest pearl bestowed by the Creator. It is the crystallization of wisdom and makes the impossible seem plausible. It is also the only avenue for a mortal to converse with the gods. Do you want to learn such an amazing skill? Link smiled at Rylai. I want to. Rylai was completely drawn in. She felt like Link was extending his hands to pull her out of the mire that was her fate. He was like a god delivering his grace to the mortal world. In that instant, she forgot all her fears and pressure. Even after she had great accomplishments in magic many years later, this scene would still be etched clearly in her mind. The lazy and young magician, laying on his chair, opening her eyes to a whole new world. Sit down over here. Link knew that he had successfully relieved the tension. Rylai carefully sat beside him. Between them was a table with three magic books and a magic scroll. Link waited for Rylai to recollect herself, before asking, Can you read? Rylai nodded. Yes, my father once taught me. Good. This was good news. Link would not have to spend time teaching Rylai how to read, which was a foundation for learning magic. He then pushed the magic scrolls towards Rylai. Have you used a magic scroll before? No. Rylai shook her head. On the other hand, her eyes were curiously eyeing the magic scroll on the table. Open it. Link chuckled. Link knew that the first step to learning magic was usually the toughest. This was because behind the glory and mysterious facade of magic was a network of complex theories and formations. Many people with extraordinary magic potential gave up as they could not stand having to learn the mundane basic theories. Link was busy and would not have much time to tutor Rylai. Most of the time, she would have to learn magic by herself. Hence, Link would have to evoke her interest to facilitate her self-study. Rylai placed the magic scroll on her lap and carefully opened it. The spell enchanted onto the scroll was a level zero spell, Illumination. Link had made alterations to the scroll such that only people with magic potential would be able to activate the spell sealed within. Can you see the single glowing rune on the magic scroll? Link asked. Yes. Rylai nodded. Her eyes shone as she held the magic scroll in her hand. She was extremely afraid to move in fear of damaging the scroll. Now clear your mind of any thoughts and focus on this rune. Link was patiently guiding Rylai along. 
After 10 seconds, the rune glowed with a bright light which flowed to illuminate the rest of the writings on the magic scroll. A ball of light then slowly rose up from the scroll. You can control it, am I right? Link softly asked. Yes. Rylai was intrigued. She felt that her spirit was connected tightly to this ball of light. If she willed it to go to the left, it would slowly float towards the left side. It was amazing. She disregarded Link's gaze and was fully absorbed into the magic, willing it to go further and further away. When the ball of light reached a distance of 45 feet, the connection she had felt previously suddenly disappeared. The ball of light quivered before disintegrating into the air. This was not out of Riley's expectations. However, she was still dumbfounded and trying to process what had just happened. Link did not disrupt her thoughts and slowly waited till Riley was done reminiscing about the wonders of magic. That was the illumination spell. It is your very first spell. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, Riley cheerfully agreed. That was a mysterious experience. However, that spell was not cast by you, but by the assistance of the magic scroll. A real magician can cast even more powerful spells without the help of any object. Link then materialized a glass orb in his hand. When he snapped his fingers, the glass orb would disappear and become a gentle ball of light. After one second, the sphere of light would be transformed into a high-pitched whistle, its sound reverberating through the room. Rylai was completely awestruck by the seamless transition between the different spells. Teacher, what do I need to do? Rylai spoke after a moment of silence. First, read these three books. Link pushed the three magic books on the table towards Rylai. The books were The Original Thoughts, Man of the Extension of the Mind, and The Theory of the Foundations of Magic. These three books were called the Enlightenment Books of Magic, widely used to train the foundational skills of budding magicians using a specific training regime. Follow whatever that is stated in the book. I will determine the results of your training the next time I return from the academy. If I am satisfied with your progress, I will teach you how to release your first spell," Link said. I understand, Rylai nodded. After Link's stunning display of magic, her fear had turned into curiosity and determination. She was certain that grasping this power would allow her to change her fate. Link was satisfied when he saw the determination in Rylai's eyes. He was certain that if Rylai continued to hold this passion for magic, she would become a well-known name amongst magicians in ten years' time. All he needed to do was guide her along the way and provide her with opportunities to practice magic. He had not only accomplished all his duties in River Cove Town, but also managed to recruit a talented magician. It was time for him to return to the academy. After bidding his goodbyes, Link boarded the carriage bound for East Cove Higher Magic Academy. He was carrying a bag full of snacks prepared by Lucy for him to munch on along the way. Link kept the window open and whistled while admiring the beautiful scenery of the Gervant Forest. It had been an incredible break from his mundane life in the academy. However, the good times did not last. Link felt a strong disturbance in the wind element on both sides of King's Lane. He was the target of a high-level spell. Someone is trying to ambush me. This feeling, it is at least a level 3 wind elemental spell. Link was shocked. He had to think of something fast. Level 3 Defensive Magic, Edelweiss. The moment his defensive spell took form, three wind blades at least six feet in length plowed through the forest in a neat formation, heading murderously towards the only carriage in sight. Link was in danger. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 100, The Cost of Underestimating the Opponent. Once he saw the wind daggers, Link immediately recognized it as one of the spells of the air element, Storm of Daggers. Storm of Daggers. Level 3 spell. Effects. Concentrated wind energy formed into three extremely sharp daggers. When the wind daggers hit their target, they will break up into countless small daggers, enveloping an area of about 30 feet wide. Note, its nickname in battlefields is Meat Grinder Dot. To ordinary people, there was nowhere to hide from this lethal spell. Even if they managed to dodge the direct attacks of the three wind daggers, they would be faced with the deadly shards had formed after that. The only fate that awaited them was death. To a magician, though, as long as they could cast a defensive spell of the same level, 
The Storm of Daggers was even easier to block than any other spell of the same level. The reason for that was simple. It was spread out into a big area. The strength of the Storm of Daggers was also too scattered, making it extremely easy to deflect. With Edelweiss, Link had nothing to fear of the onslaught of the Storm of Daggers. He could even retaliate with his own attacks immediately, although there was a slight problem because the opponent was hiding among the trees. Link could only estimate his location by the trail of fluctuating mana he left behind. Right now, what he needed was a powerful spell that would work in a big area. As the thought occurred, Link stumbled on the perfect solution immediately. What would be a more suitable spell to use in this situation than Flame Blast? Like the Storm of Daggers, Flame Blast's attack was spread out into a huge area, but it was also a level higher than the Storm of Daggers. Link used the Matchstick Wand to cast this Flame Blast, so it was not as powerful as the one he unleashed in Gladstone, although it was still a force to be reckoned with. Because Flame Blast was a level 4 spell, its spell casting time could be as long as 2 seconds, which was far too long to leave oneself vulnerable to the opponent's attacks. That's where the Domingo Crystal came in handy. When Link was in River Cove Town, he imbued enough fire element into the Domingo Crystal for one flame blast, and now was the perfect time to use it. Mana surged wildly and Link's body then rushed into the wand before finally forming into the complex flame blast spell structure. At the same time, under the great attraction of the spell structure of flame blast, the Domingo Crystal began to glow. The fire elements stored in it came raging out, and there was a strong resonance, quickly forming a large fireball. Link didn't stay in the carriage in the process. Before the storm of daggers hit the carriage, he opened the door and jumped out. He chose where he ran to carefully, which was in the space between the three wind daggers. In doing so, he avoided the most powerful part of the level 3 spell and had to only deal with the tiny blades afterwards. Then he could hear a whistling sound. Two wind daggers grazed past the side of his body and a portion of the daggers scraped into the Edelweiss force field, rustling Link's black hair. When his feet touched the ground, the wind daggers hit the carriage behind him. One of the daggers sliced through the carriage, splitting the entire carriage into two halves. Another dagger hit the horses and the two horses were cut into four chunks. The last one headed towards the coachman, and a second later the coachman was split in half from the waist. Bang! 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 The three wind daggers then exploded and broke up into small blades. The whistling wind suddenly picked up momentum and became violent. The air was now filled with swarms of tiny blades. The carriage, the dead horses and the coachman's corpse was turned quickly into a mass of minced flesh and crumbling dust. There were now countless microscopic wind daggers hitting Link's Edelweiss shield. The elements and the force field kept clashing with each other, each clash showing up as a spark on the outer layer of the Edelweiss shield. Both were level 3 spells, but while one was broken up and scattered, the other was intact and stable. The small blades had no chance of penetrating the shield, Link was safe without a scratch under the protection of his spell. At the same moment Link's feet was firmly on the ground, he pointed the matchstick wand towards the direction that the storm of daggers came from and immediately a blindingly bright sheet of light extended from the wand's tip. It was Link's flame blast, unleashed at a breakneck speed. If slowed down, one would then see that the blinding light was made up of an incandescent fireball the size of a soccer ball surrounded by a visible heat wave about three feet thick around the fireball, a sign that showed just how blisteringly hot the fireball was. Link had managed to cast flame blast in 1.1 seconds, an almost unimaginable speed. About half a second later, the flame blast fireball burst into the forest and exploded. Boom! The explosion was ear-splittingly loud. It kept the ground rumbling for a few seconds and it created a powerful shock wave that was visible to the naked eye. It was strong enough to shake and quiver the trees in the forest. This then sent the birds in the trees flying frantically in droves, almost covering the sky in a dark mass. In the midst of the thundering explosion, Link could make out a scream. He knew instantly that his spell had hit the opponent and had even seriously hurt the opponent. He'd cast a level 4 spell in 1.1 seconds. It was so incredibly fast that he was sure that there was no chance for the opponent to hide or evade from the flame blast assault. In fact, even Link wasn't sure if he could survive from such an attack himself because in the absence of preparation. 
Almost no magician on the Fireman continent could build a level 4 defensive spell within 1.1 seconds, unless he was equipped with a powerful magic gear or a defensive Domingo crystal. The dense forest in front of him was blown into a mess of wood and leaves. In the center of the explosion, a tree was blown into oblivion, and around it there was crater about a foot and a half wide. On the edge of the crater, the vegetation was on fire, making a crackling sound as they burned. Link then walked up to the crater. He wanted to see who the attacker was with his own eyes. He was capable of casting a level 3 spell, so Link knew at least that this was no ordinary rogue or bandit. Link protected himself with the Edelweiss spell and gave himself a boost from the cat's agility spell. Link slowly approached the crater, but he couldn't find a dead body. He searched all around, but the shrubs were all burning, so there was no way that anyone could be hiding behind them. Link continued to look around before he finally found a corpse under a tree. No, it wasn't a corpse, the man was still alive. He was desperately leaning against the tree, and his clothes were burned to crisp, leaving only a few wisps of rags hanging on it. The exposed skin was burned and blackened too and his hands were tightly clutching a wand, but the wand was already shattered, only half of it remained. He heard Link's movement, so he opened his eyes which were slightly shut before. How did you know Flame Blast? How did you cast it so quickly? He deliriously asked in a hoarse voice. Link couldn't be any older than 17, how was it possible that he could master a level 4 spell? And how did he manage to cast it in such a frightening speed? None of it made sense to Darius. He never thought that he would be defeated by attacks that he didn't even understand. If it had been any other magician, a flame blast would require three seconds to cast. That would be more than enough time for Darius to counter the opponent's spell, or even kill them before the completion of the spell casting. At the very least, he would have had the time to escape from the center of explosion, and he would not have ended up as badly injured as he was now. But everything happened too fast. He had just unleashed the storm of daggers and didn't even have time to see the results of his attack before he was attacked by the flame blast. He initially thought that it was just a very big level 3 fireball. If he didn't cast a level 2 guarding barrier on himself before he unleashed the storm of daggers, by now he would have been blown to pieces. It was as if he'd been assuming that his opponent was a defenseless pig waiting to be slaughtered, only to find out that the pig was in fact a powerful dragon that could finish him off in one move. Link's gaze, however, was fixed on the broken wand in his hand. Are you Darius? He asked. This greenish wand was made of a special wooden material and Link clearly recalled seeing Darius wielding it in Bale's mage tower, so he naturally recognized it at a glance. Darius ignored the question, his blood-red eyes were staring fixedly at Link. You answer my questions first, Darius then said. Although it wasn't a direct answer, the response had nonetheless confirmed Link's suspicion. He'd also seen through Darius' plans by the actions he took. Since you've made a move against me, that means you must have found out about what I did in River Cove Town, said Link. I'd only ever used level 2 spells there, so you must have thought that I was a level 2 magician. You used the level 3 spell Storm of Daggers to attack me and even ambush me in the carriage. But I don't think you intended to kill me at all. You only meant to incapacitate me then squeeze out as much information from me as you could, especially about the identity of the person who sent me to investigate Bale in the first place. The fact that you didn't hesitate to kill the coachman showed that you were out for blood. You were going to get rid of me and those behind me once and for all. Am I right? Dara stared at Link in horror as he spelled out his plan step by step as if he could see through his soul and read his mind. Link knew that the look on Dara's face proved that he was right. So he smiled and said, The only mistake you made was to underestimate my strength. Then, Link lifted his wand and pointed it at Dara's forehead. His face was cold and emotionless when he said, Darius, am I right in saying that your tutor is messing with black magic and that you are assisting him? So what if that's true? Answered Darius. Master Bale is only searching for a way to live forever, he never did any harm to anyone, so why should he be punished? Darius didn't want to die, but logic and experience told him that it was all over for him. Driven by fear, he began to scream hysterically. Are you sure what you're doing is truly harmless? Said Link, shaking his head. Look at what you did! What did that coachman do to deserve that fate? When he was alive, he was a woman's husband, 
a child's father, a father's son, he might even be the sole pillar of support for his family. And yet you killed him without even batting an eye. Do you see how cold-blooded you've become? He's just a peasant. So what if I killed a peasant? Darius pressed on, though there was now much less conviction in his words. Oh yes, you're right. He was indeed just a peasant. Need I remind you who else was just a peasant, Darius? Have you completely forgotten your roots now that you've learned to cast a few spells? Said Link sneering. Darius was speechless. Link's words had hit his soft spot. Just kill me then, Darius finally said. You're the winner, so you can say whatever you want. Oh, you're wrong again, Darius. I'm not going to kill you, said Link, shaking his head. Your actions today are the ironclad proof that Bale was involved in black magic. I will take you back to the academy. The moment Link finished his sentence, Darius finally lost all control and shouted in fear. No, please, I can't go back, he begged. I can't betray my tutor. Please just kill me now. If he was brought back to the East Cove Magic Academy, he would then receive the punishments for disobeying the rules of the Academy, and his name would forever be condemned there. He would also be stripped of his magical powers and become an ordinary man who, because of the murder, would then be tried by the civil courts and his neck would eventually end up on a guillotine. Then, his name would be disgraced for centuries after his own death, and to him, this fate was much worse than death itself. As it happened, the mana in his body started to boil up. He was attempting to use magic to commit suicide. Link sneered at the sight then kicked him in the neck, which knocked him out straight away. What a selfish and hypocritical scum. You can't betray your tutor? Ha! Huh. It's your own hide that you can't betray. As Link was kicking Darius, a notification popped up suddenly on the interface. It was announcing that the mission of investigating Bale was completed. Investigation mission completed. Player rewarded with 25 Omni points. New mission activated. Expose. Mission details. Expose the magician Bale's involvement with black magic without tarnishing the East Cove Magic Academy's good reputation. Mission rewards. 40 Omni points. This was another mission that Link was more than happy to accept. That's the end. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.